Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Paul Schmelzing. Paul is an economic historian, a visiting scholar at the Bank of England, and a postdoc at the Yale School of Management. Paul has written a riveting paper on the long history of interest rates. It is titled Eight Centuries of Global Real Interest Rates, R minus G, and the Super Secular Decline, 1311 to 2018. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, David, for having me. Now, some listeners might chuckle when I use the word riveting for a a paper that covers 700 years of interest rate history, but it really is. It really is interesting, and it touches on a number of important topics we'll get to today, like secular stagnation, wealth inequality, and and what can policy do in the future if interest rates are all negative. So it is riveting, and, it, and it's fascinating, and if you love history, you'll love this paper. So we'll have a link to it on our website, and we're going to talk a lot about it today. But it's an ambitious project. Well, you're a historian. I'm an economist. I don't know. I have the energy or heart to dig through the archives to collect eight centuries of <laughs> data. But you did this. So tell us, how did you even get into this project? What motivated you to take on such a huge project? Well, it was, uh, I guess, my third year in the PhD in 2016 uh, when I relocated to London for for a year. This was just before the whole referendum and the, when the whole Brexit debate took over. People were still very much discussing uh, secular stagnation and the the new challenges for monetary policy, uh, you know, all over the place. And so I got into these discussions uh, pretty early on. The discussions outside of the Bank of England in London in the financial community were all about the big bond bull market, uh, unprecedented in history. And so I, I realized that the underlying core of these debates is essentially a debate about interest rates, uh, particularly real interest rates. And I came to realize after a while that really people keep referring to to one source in the end, which is the classic Homer and Scylla yep. uh, history of interest rates. I have it on my shelf. Exactly. The and it's and it's really, you know, fabulous, groundbreaking work. Nevertheless, for a historian, you realize that it's uh it has a lot of issues. Um not just because it's now fifty five years old, I guess but because it never relied on primary sources and never relied on uh, printed primary sources. So for all their great work, uh, Sidney Homer and, and Richard Silla, they never actually went to the archives and tried to uh, piece piece uh, new uh, data together. Uh, and Interesting. So, so it's all secondary sources they used to exactly. create their time series. And so as a historian, naturally, uh, our habitat, our bread and butter is to go to the archives and try to right. recreate these series and get a better picture. And so I was kind of uh, struck that, you know, at a lot of these conferences that I went to, people discussing secular stagnation at some point went, now let's look at the history of, of real interest rates and brought up this uh, chart by Mervyn King and David Lowe that, that basically starts in 1970s. And so... Uh, it makes historians naturally uncomfortable. Yeah, that kind of begs the question, what is history? How far back do you have to go to be a historian? The <laughs> 1970s doesn't cut it, huh? Um, I, I wouldn't say you have to go back to the 14th century, I guess. But a lot of financial historians would agree that um, it was at some point in the late 13th, early 14th century that modern finance in many ways came into existence, per okay. se, uh, in the Italian city-states. That's when you had the first consolidated debt markets. Um, you had bonds trading on secondary markets between people from all over the world, from all over Europe, certainly. And that's the first time when you can really create a continuous series for long-term uh, real interest rates. That's when we also start having the price data, the inflation data. So that was a natural starting point. But, but certainly we, uh, you know, most people say anything before your birth is, is already history. So you were motivated by the fact that lots of discussions over secular stagnation, and to really make the case for secular stagnation, it has to be done in a historical context, and the historical context maybe goes back to the 50s, maybe the 70s, but more modern history. And so you wanted to really get to the long history. So you weren't 
satisfied with what economists were calling history. And so it prompted you to dig into the archives all the way back to the 14th century. And as a result, you now have, I'm guessing, the longest time series we have in uh, economic history. I mean, are there any other time series that run 700 years? I mean... I mean, we not on the interest side, but of course on the GDP side, there's increasing uh, great progress to recreate uh, GDP series for most of the advanced economies. People like Steve Broadberry have done this for England. Uh, others have done it for Spain. For on an Portugal. annual basis? Or? On an annual basis, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, Bob Allen has done that for the for the price series. Okay. Um, so for interest rate data, you're, you're like the final word. Exactly, but, but for interest rates, we, we didn't have this so far. I mean, we have a lot of great country-level uh, yep. studies, of course, for certain sub-periods, but it's really very much a patchwork um, situation out there. There's no aggregate attempt to really put all of this together. And um, I guess this would all be nice anecdotal evidence if it didn't have, in the end, uh, in my view, a, a big bearing on these current policy debates. Absolutely. You know? And so it would probably have stayed a sort of uh, side project slash hobby if I didn't um, really get the impression that it changes the some of the narratives that, that we currently do. Yeah. So I want to get into your data itself and the process of how you did it. But this is kind of a, on a sidebar here. So unrelated to your paper, I, I'm just curious, is there evidence of interest rates before this time? So like if, if you go back and look at, say, Babylonian cuneiform or tablets, do they talk about interest rates? Are there like ancient history interest rate data? Homer and Scylla, obviously, they have some evidence from Roman times, from Greek okay. times, and even Babylonian times. Uh now, that's really where I have to pass in the end because <laughs> <laughs> it's already a challenge to decipher um, medieval sources. Right. Uh, and um, I think, obviously, you would have to cut out uh, a lot of the – what historians call the Dark Ages, anything between the Roman Republic and, say, the you know the, the 12th, 13th century is really um, a completely dark territory in terms of the archival situation, in terms of the – data situation. So you wouldn't be able, I would I would think, to build a continuous series. Time so, series. Yeah. But you have peaked at this data? I mean, if you, if you, I mean, you read Homer and, and Scylla, and I, forgive me, I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've looked at their book. Um, but were interest rates, say, back in Babylonian time, was it positive, had positive rates? Were yields generally positive or any negative rates back then? Or No, I think I, I recall a few extreme data points in the, in the Babylonian times. I mean, I, I think they have a few triple digit uh, okay <laughs> no war rates. times probably yeah, yeah exactly. or stress okay well let's let's leave the ancient history behind because that's not your paper it's not fair for me to ask you questions about it but it's super fascinating super fascinating in fact i had mark koyoma on the show we talked about the economy of ancient rome peter timmon has a book on the roman economy really neat stuff but we'll leave that behind and stick to your paper today so you again have this amazing paper about eight centuries of data 700 plus years, goes back to the 14th century, and countries include Italy, Holland, France, Spain, UK, Germany, United States, Japan. So you have data on everything from Keynes to the city-states to modern governments. How did you actually go about collecting the data? What was the process? Because that sounds like a Herculean task to me. For for these countries, we have varying degrees of, of published uh, stuff that's out there. I would say probably... England uh, is, is is of course very well documented, um, and and Italy itself is is nicely documented. For for most of the other countries, um, you really pretty soon have to go into the archives physically, or to the extent that stuff is digitized, um, you have to rely on archival data in the end. I mean, there's great stuff uh, like uh, Gino Lusato's work on on Venice, for instance. Uh, quite a few. Books and, and papers came out in the late 19th century where we had this historical turn in uh, in the social sciences in, in Europe at least uh, where a lot of this stuff was published from the political economy departments in, in Europe. But after that, there was really a, a long period of, of silence and, and people didn't work on these issues. Um, and so – Actual archival research is, is one key of the so, uh, source. The other is uh, what the historians call pr uh, printed primary sources, i.e. Uh, we have a lot of historians who went into the archives and simply uh, copied what is in what is in the archives in the uh, and, and copied this stuff in chronological order in 
so-called registries and, and, and publish this via publishers. And so we have for a lot of the, the leading municipalities in Europe, we have so-called registries, which are sort of, you can think of them, them as uh, political diaries to an extent. Okay. So all the geopolitical events are recorded by the Duke of Saxony in the Saxonian registry, yeah. right? Same goes for uh, the leading commercial cities in, in northern France and in, in today's uh, Netherlands, which were at the forefront of, of financial development. So we have these really chronological uh, registries for these kind of cities where they recorded their debt operations among a lot of other things. And so th these are a great uh, resource to to build these kind of series. As far as I can see, they are criminally underused in, in these kind of exercises. But uh, obviously, these kind of cities accounted for a big share of the debt market activity for the financial innovation that was going on. And they were in many ways a uh, role model for the later central states uh, to to aspire to. Yeah, so these three so these three uh, categories were really the um, printed stuff, secondary stuff, printed primary sources, and the primary archive. So did you have to travel around the different these different countries and and look yeah. at this stuff? Okay, so you speak multiple languages, I assume, able to read in different. You know, it, uh, I never would have thought that it that it uh, will be useful in the end. But I took actually Latin in high school, and so uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, I all you parents that, out there trying to get your kids to learn Latin, here's a good <laughs> example of why you should. So, unfortunately, uh, a lot of these uh, 14th century things are uh, a convolution of Latin and and local languages okay. uh, put together, and it's a uh, it's a really uh, terrible mix sometimes, but. To the extent that you only care about the data, you can extract the the data points and and um, calculate the interest rates. So, and and uh, I had help from medievalists who do this twenty four seven who read these kind of sources to to double check that I'm not uh, <laughs> recording uh, dates or something. You know, so this is interesting because I've looked into the Roman period. I mentioned before we had Mark Koyoma. I mean. When I say, look, I've glanced from a historian's perspective, because there are some interesting financial events that happen in the Roman period, including there's a financial crisis of 33 AD, and it, it looks a lot like a liquidity crisis. And I'm like, man, this would be really cool to, to dig into the archives. And then I realized you got to speak Latin. You have to learn or whatever language the historians – there were several ancient historians who actually wrote about – there's three ancient historians who wrote about the crisis of 33 but to really understand them, you really need to know the original languages, and that's just a dead end for me at least, and I imagine for many other uh, economists. But you took on the task, you uh, a labor of love for the rest of us, so that we can use your series. So 707 years, is that right? Yeah, I guess. It, it starts really in, in the year 1311, which is when we have uh, Bob Allen's North Italian okay. Price uh, series. Uh, you, ca you can go back further on the nominal side, but um, since we're interested in real in real rates, that was yeah. a natural starting point here. Yeah, yeah so you ha had the inflation data, you had the nominal interest rate data, and uh, you also had some GDP data too that someone else had, had built as part of your story, right? So yeah, like I said, I, I spent most of the time collecting nominal long-term interest rate data. The inflation data, as I mentioned, a lot of it uh, is it's, uh, based on the great work of Bob Allen. Uh, I replicated in some cases his his baskets to see how they perform in, in different cities that he didn't cover. He, he covered 20 cities across Europe, which is uh, a sufficient basis for, for these kind of series. But um, on the GDP side, certainly, as I mentioned, uh, Steve Broadbury, for instance, has, okay. has pioneered this for England. Uh, and we have series for basically all the countries that I cover on the interest rate side. Um, yeah. Only I think Germany and France are still a bit patchy. I haven't seen really consistent long-run series, but um, we can interpolate on, on that side. I've seen some of this data, I think, when we've looked at questions of, you know, what did the average person's life look like, you know, three, four hundred years ago? I mean, this the stark fact is that everyone, or most everyone, used to be poor. I mean, human history has been mostly poor people with a few rich elites until the last few hundred years, the Industrial Revolution. And it's fascinating to look at these time series of GDP that go way back. You can see they all converged <laughs> very low level. So that's been my limited exposure to some of this GDP data, but very fascinating stuff. Well, let's move on to your key findings. And really, I guess that the big finding, which is what's in the title of your paper, is, 
is that interest rates have been trending down for 500 years. Now, you have 700 years worth of data, but you find that interest rates have been going down for 500 years. And you, I think, show 46 instances of negative rates since 1311. Um, and there's you, you note there are some temporary stabilization periods. You list 1550 to 1640, 1820 to 1850, and then in our recent history, 1950 to 1980. And I, I think many of us have as an anchor point that 1950 to 1980. And even you know after the after Paul Volcker and the disinflation rates come down up until you know 2008. All this talk about we got to normalize interest rates, you know, and, and I think there's even there's some confusion. I think central banks tend to follow the natural rate. But nonetheless, talk about we need to get rates back up to normal levels. And what your paper clearly shows is there isn't a normal level of interest rates. And there is no what you would call virtual stability. Also, you look at capital returns as well as safe asset yields. Maybe talk about you looked at two different measures of interest rates. Maybe speak to that. So the uh, one of the headline series is really um, GDP weighing these different geographies okay. you just mentioned. And together, these countries account for roughly 80% of advanced economy GDP over time. Um, so this is best thought of as uh, advanced economy real rates over the long run, right? Um, yep. I mean, I'm, I'm leaving some out like, like Portugal or so, but these are 2% uh, at, at maximum advanced economy GDP. So it really tracks uh, most of advanced economies over time for these 700 years. Um, but then, of course, people would push back on, on several points on these aggregate series. They include uh, funny stuff uh, like default events, of course, right? There's all sorts of market imperfections, which which people might... might uh, uh, might call market imperfections uh, in there, so you can you can test these kind of trends on on different levels. Of course, I wanted to make a hopefully a fairly robust case that we are seeing this downward trend, irrespective of a certain financial asset, a certain geography, uh, or a certain um, risk premium uh, uh, associated with a certain issuer. Um, and so. The, the one the one headline series is is this what I call the global uh, GDP series, uh, where we see roughly one point six basis points on average downwards every year for these seven hundred years, uh, and an an observer the bottom line an observer in the late fifteenth century, uh, early sixteenth century who had access to this kind of data uh, would already have concluded with an extrapolation that we are facing this kind of zero lower bound problem in the early 21st century. That's yeah, we point. were joking about this before the show. If you had your data, if you'd started maybe, say, 400 years ago, you had 100 years worth of data, you could have predicted where we would be today, which is pretty amazing. That's the point. Uh, and I think uh, from what I can see, we have a few nice uh, historical study, like like um, Barry Eichengreen has, has written a nice uh, uh, shorter paper on, on secular stagnation in history. But as far as I can see, no paper has has shown that we have this kind of consistent downward trend in in real rates over such a horizon. Now, to your question about the the safe rates, of course, uh, I've I've had some people ask, well, aren't you just capturing the risk premium over time? Obviously, these countries have have become safer over time. Uh, these kind of kings and and dukes uh, defaulted all the time in the 14th and 15th century. You have all these stories about. Uh, the Medici going bankrupt and all these wealthy merchants being uh, put into prison when they demanded repayment, you know, which <laughs> right. is true. But in my view, it is it is not a case of, of the risk premium. And that's why you can build a series uh, that tracks the safe issuer over time. You know, the, the equivalent issuer to the U.S. 10-year nowadays over time. Uh, because it's um, – when you look at the historical sources, it's quite clear – that people over time had a an idea about relative safety between different issuers, right? Uh, and in a lot of sources, actual actually they explicitly refer to, you know, what is the safe place where I can put my money, given all these wars and given all these uh, risky events. So there's always been a safe asset shortage issue relative to the time they lived exactly. In. And um, you can broadly track. I mean, it starts with the North Italian city states, uh, which, um, you know, apart from a few uh, outliers, were really uh, 
quite quite prudent uh, in in serving the debt um and then you know you switch to to spain you switch switch to the habsburgs which had the strongest military the strongest um uh financial centers uh, controlled in the spanish netherlands and these kind of areas and then you switch to amsterdam london and finally the united states when you when you build this kind of series which i call the the safe issuer series you have not a single default event on the long term debt over these 700 okay. years and it is consistent with other research um ie on the on the gdp side which confirms that that the geography i track uh is is the geography which with the fastest uh, gdp growth okay uh, and with the deepest uh and most innovative capital markets. And so uh, I'm making the case that it's not really uh, a story about the risk premium uh, decline. The risk premium declines, no doubt, um, but the proportions are, are uh, quite different. Okay, for the safe assets series, you found that it declines 0.9 basis points a year or almost one basis point a year. And that compares to the 1.6 basis points for the uh, global measure. So one basis point a year and you know you you take this and i think i read somewhere you you take the implication and again there there's there's this is a trend there are deviations around this trend i mean 19 you know 70s and 80s was clearly a deviation around this but you note that you know sometime in the next decade we're going to be in negative interest rate territory here in the united states in advanced economies i mean europe sees it already and, that, and that's something i've made on this show too. I mean, but I've looked at more short-term phenomenon, demographics, the inability of the developing world to produce safe assets. So everyone comes to the U.S. looking for safe assets. But your kind of trend, just the kind of naive, naive trend would make tell a similar story that within this decade, we're going to see short rates and long rates zero or below. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, um, I have this graph which is deliberately a bit provocative, uh, <laughs> just extrapolating this kind of trend yeah. in, into the next uh, uh, decades or so. Um, and if you uh, extrapolate these trends, it is um, uh, it is obvious that that we'll not just hit the the zero lower bound on uh, across the maturity structure, um, but we are going beneath it. Not radically. Um, I I do believe that is that there is some sort of uh, negative point where you know people just pull all their the assets effective into. lower bound huh exactly we're not talking about uh minus three or minus four percent but we're talking about a consistent uh, trend in that direction so by by the year 2050 I'm, I'm making the case that uh the some of these slopes the historical slopes that i show uh, have uh point seven percent uh negative uh rates okay and that, i guess other people might disagree, but I, this strikes me as as a level which is still consistent with people uh, tolerating it to some extent, and the financial system being able to to work around these kind of levels uh, to an extent. But I guess it it uh, requires a um, a rethink of our frameworks in 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 in, in a broader sense. Uh, if once we accept that this is a a long run trend which has always been with us, and where there is, as you said where there's really um, no indication that we have some sort of normal steady state level uh, at, say, between 2 or 4%. This is um, embedded in a lot of these uh, macro models, I guess, uh, and a lot of these uh, DCFs that people in investment banks have, but, but there's no historical basis for that. And this is fascinating because it has huge implications for financial intermediation. I mean, I mean, w one thing would be one offsetting factor would be if there still is a spread between long and short rates. So even if they all go negative, are they going to get compressed more, do you think? Or will there still be a sufficient spread to you know motivate financial intermediation? Do you think that's an issue? That's not something I've investigated. Okay. Uh, uh, as, as you note, uh, I'm talking about long rates only. Uh, in, in that one chart you you uh, referred to, I just made an assumption that the maturity structure, that the... That the uh, okay. 10 to two year spread will stay relatively constant and then since we're moving down on the long rate what's the implication for the yeah. short rate but of course the the steepness might might change on yeah the curve. and um, well to the extent this this lower bound is binding I mean it suggests to me that the spread will be reduced because <laughs> at some point you want to get out and so this could really change the nature of finance because finance is kind of premised on some 
you know, fund short term, invest or lend long term um, with with a higher yield. But this may be putting a dent in that basic no, but, but model. You touch upon an interesting point because um, I found in the in the wake of this research on the long rate that uh, the the structure of the yield curve has shown really uh, curious properties over time as well. You know, oh. it's a fact that the that the yield curve for most of these seven hundred years. Uh, in 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 many of these countries is naturally inverted. Um, you know, oh, really? Even, even outside of. So you're saying the upward sloping yield curve is also a more recent. It seems to be. I mean, innovation. It, it would be interesting to do more uh, systematic research on that. I've not done that in this paper. Um, but you've but seen glimpses of negative or inverted yield curves going way back. Exactly, huh? and 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 some authors um, imply that with, with the kind of data they have found. Uh, but it seems to be. Um, my hunch is that it's 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 a more a systematic feature of the oh great the early modern financial <laughs> system. Which Paul, this show's getting really depressing here. Negative rates, inverted yield curves, as far as the eye can see. Wow. Okay, this is a dystopia that. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, this is good. It's good stuff. We need to know this stuff and to prepare for it. And I want to get later. We'll talk about why this is the case and why. Why don't we have like, you know, innovation, expected productivity growth that could offset some of those declines? We'll come back to that later. But just to reiterate what you find in the paper, and again, I encourage the listeners to take a look at the paper if you haven't already. But you know, and I'm going to read some quotes from your paper, that this downward trend has persisted throughout the historical gold, silver, mixed bullion, and fiat money regimes, is visible across various asset classes, and long preceded the emergence of modern central banks. So it's kind of independent of the monetary regime, because it's easy to say, oh, you know, central banks have not done a great job, or, oh, it was the gold standard, or oh, it was this standard. But you're saying it's it's a robust finding across these regimes, no matter what. And in fact, you go on later, you say the forces responsible have been indifferent to monetary or political regimes. They have kept exercising their pull on interest rate levels, irrespective of the existence of central banks, de jure usury laws, or permanently higher public expenditures. They persisted in what amounted to early modern patrician plutocracies, as well as modern democratic environments, in periods of low-level feudal battles, and in those of professional mechanized mass warfare. So it's Almost like a law of nature. It's like we could add another law. I have law of gravity. We've got the law of decline <laughs> rates. Now, not quite a law, but it's definitely a, a powerful force that seems to persist despite human in innovations in how we run society. You know, I was surprised by that kind of consistency. The the first, almost the first thing they taught me at, at LSE and in the economic history course was the North Weingast uh, framework and the big institutional factors uh, over time. So, for instance, I would have expected uh, some sort of big inflection point in in 1694, in uh, at the time when we have you know the Bank of England and successively you know the other central banks are added to the picture. Um, but surprisingly, you know, there's no big 1688 or 1694 inflection. Neither, you know, when the Riggs Bank is founded before that or or after that, when we have the the Fed founded, in it is really um and it persists as you say across. You know these these quasi feudal states in the, in the 14th and 15th century, just as it does in in modern democracies. So there's 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 something more fundamental to it, um, and and it certainly did surprise me as well. The kind of consistency. Well, let me just play devil's advocate here. I know some listeners are big fans of the classical gold standard. <laughs> not not all of them, but I know some of them would say, "Hey, classical gold standard, late 18 1870, say 1914." It worked relatively well compared to, say, the interwar gold standard, which was a big disaster. But uh, that didn't matter either, right? It, it, this trend still persisted even during the classical gold standard. So it's not, again, a, a monetary regime phenomenon or force. We actually have a, have a pretty uh, constant uh, adherence to a gold slash uh, gold silver standard uh, in, in most of these. So basically between the 14th and, and uh in 19th century, it's it's either you know with varying shares, silver or gold. When the Spanish discovered the New World, uh, yeah. they bring in obviously tons of first uh, silver and then then gold, and it, they uh, change the mix a little bit. But given given the kind of uh, persistence in in that in the international financial system, 
it was surprising to me that we still see okay. this kind of trend uh, continue no matter what the exact. Yeah, I mean, because you're looking at real interest rates too. So in theory, those should at, at some point in the long run be independent of, of the regimes. But it, it, regimes could influence in the short run, but it's still what you find is this downward trend. Okay, so pretty stark findings. Maybe we'll still be alive, but our, our, our children will definitely live in this world of, of uh, negative rates if, if these trends continue. What does this mean for current economic debates? I'm going to bring up two. Actually, the third one I, I touched on in terms of like what monetary policy should do. But the two big ones I think that come up in your paper are secular stagnation. And the other one is the Thomas Piketty um, argument that there will be endless um, wealth accumulation or the term he uses, endless inegalitarian spiral. So let's let's do secular stagnation first. What do these findings imply about secular stagnation? And has there been any pushback from the advocates of secular stagnations to your findings? So the way I understand secular stagnation, it, it, it makes a slightly different, it doesn't make a direct argument about real interest rates. It, of course, talks about neutral yep. uh, real rates. And, and that is something you cannot directly observe or directly measure. Um, you have to make assumptions about how that neutral rate is determined. So some of the advocates of, of secular stagnation are making the argument that um, they're not exactly talking about the outright uh, real rate, okay. but, but a interest rate that is consistent with the economy being at potential output and, and with, with a steady inflation path, I guess. But my my sense is really, um, and and my read of, of recent papers estimating the neutral rate is that really the, the long-term neutral rate uh, and, and the observed exposed real rate more or less move in tandem over the long run. You know, I'm not making an argument about the business cycle or about shorter term fluctuations where uh, by all means they, they could be out of sync and potential output might might deviate and etc. But um, the way I read the data by by people like uh, John Roberts at the at, at the Board of Governance, for instance, he has published some data is really that the trend is the same for the for the neutral rate since the 1970s. More or less, these two rates uh, move together, and I don't see any particular reason why, over the very long term, these two rates should be radically out of sync. Um, and so you would expect, if you approximate the neutral rate over a similar horizon, you know, it, it involves a lot more challenges, of course, uh, but to show the same properties. Um, and so in that sense, I think my skepticism about the secular stagnation theory still stands in the sense that uh, the current levels of global real interest rates, long-term real interest rates, is very much at historical trend. As I mentioned, uh, you know, the, uh, the bond investors of the, of the 17th century or so uh, who started collecting data systematically – if they extrapolated their trends, they would have arrived uh, at the effective the amount yeah. uh, around these these kind of years in the early 21st century. That strikes me as uh, evidence that we are talking about much more deeper, uh, more persistent phenomenon than the sort of post-1980 deviation that so many people talk about, uh, not least uh, Larry Summers and others. Um, so uh, we should be focusing on uh, the 1960s and 70s as being a weird outlier in many ways. You know, why do real interest rates break out suddenly, and why why has such uh, a persistence in the in the downward trend occurred over such a time? And all we are seeing in many ways, uh, I'm saying, is a, is a trend return since the 1980s, since Paul Volcker declared war on inflation. Uh, he triggered a, a return to trend, and, and we are still in that kind of uh, adjustment process, and it shouldn't surprise anybody uh, who had access to that kind of data. Little did Paul Volcker know that he was just returning us to trend. <laughs> what has been the blowback? I know you've gotten some pushback from some of these these folks. What what do they say when they see your, your data, and, and they're like, oh, maybe I am too narrowly focused, or do they have some other thoughts? No, I mean I mentioned the um, the risk premium has certainly come up. Yeah. And, um, I'm capturing the risk premium uh, to varying degrees. 
Uh, it is it is a totally fair point to say. Look, obviously, countries have become safer. Default frequency has declined over time. We have a lot of examples, and and people like uh, Hans Joachim Wood have have written this great book about the lending to the borrower from hell. They refer <laughs> to uh, Philip II in the in the 16th century. Some of these issuers were notorious for yeah. for defaulting, and uh, in that sense. Uh, Borrowing hell was a pretty cramped place uh, <laughs> historically. You could put a lot of other people in there. But as I mentioned, uh, one interesting anecdote is Philip II never defaulted on long-term debt. He always defaulted, defaulted on short-term debt. Interesting. Uh, I'm isolating uh, data and series, as I mentioned, that are completely default-free and where the the investors had a reasonable expectation that this would would stay the case. Um, you actually have sources from from 15th century Venice, uh, where uh, you know the the religious orders contemplate internally where to put their money. How, where do we put uh, our money to make it safe? That's and they come up with uh, let's put it into Venice uh, because it's out of the reach of these uh, unreliable and greedy dukes in our own country. Um, and so when you look at these uh, default-free series over time, as I mentioned, we are, we're getting uh, the same kind of trend, the same consistency over time uh, and in almost similar proportions. Uh, so I estimate, uh, and you can do, of course, you can make an argument and some, some of the mercantilists have made the argument, well, no financial asset is really safe. The absolute, uh, the ultimate safe asset is land right of course you have you have confiscations in land as well right. so so nothing is ever yeah. really safe um, but that was the the concept in the in the 17th and 18th centuries so you can calculate um, you can approximate the risk premium by the spread between these kind of default free rates and land uh, to to test this in various ways well it turns out that you came to some you, you come to the same conclusion that um, the risk premium measured this kind of way uh, declines by something like 0.3, 0.4 basis points per annum. That still leaves you with 0.8, 2.2, 1.2 basis points unexplained uh, by risk premium. So okay. that is my answer. So the answer is you are looking at a truly safe asset yield over time. You've you've adjusted for some of the criticism you've gotten about the implications for secular stagnation. What also does your analysis say about the prescriptions of secular stagnation advocates? So they would say more fiscal policy, more government spending, do infrastructure projects, you know, kind of get government to step up and fill the gap in terms of spending. And I think your take is that, well, may not do that much to this. This trend is a pretty strong trend. Is is that fair? That's fair. I, I think... Uh, I haven't addressed the fiscal aspect systematically over okay. time, but we have data that show for England, for instance, it's pretty well documented, public expenditure to GDP was something like 8% in the early 18th century. By the late 20th century, it's 35%. So fiscal activity by these advanced economies has gone up significantly over the same time frame that we saw Mm -hmm. the trend decline in in real interest rates so at least on a on a sort of permanent basis on a long term basis i'm quite skeptical that simply you know increasing public fiscal expenditure will radically change that kind of trend that said uh in the short term uh, we have these kind of breakouts from the trend often they are coupled with with other geopolitical shocks like war or like wars okay uh the french revolution or the uh, great the <laughs> we need war to get yields back up well, that's an awful thought but <laughs> um, but no for sure i think i think if you're really determined if you do a radical push in the short term i would be surprised not to see uh, a reaction in 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 the yields uh, but look i mean but the long term trend still goes down no matter what exactly, and and, and and look at just the the shorter term. I mean, the the U.S. is now running deficits at at six percent last year, and and ten year Treasury yields have declined over the same yep. horizon. So that tells you that something is apparently out of sync, even in the short term. Yeah. So interesting development, interesting world we we live in. Okay, 
So that's the secular stagnation. That's most of your discussion. But you, you had a few thoughts on Thomas Piketty's, you know, view. And, and this is a different R here. So the, the previous R would be like R versus G. Uh, the previous R was a safe asset R. This is the return on capital, maybe big R. Um, any thoughts on what your analysis implies for that debate? So Thomas Piketty uses this term uh, non-human wealth returns as as his R, if, if I'm not misrepresenting him. And um, he claims that, that this non-human wealth return is uh, is almost stable over over time. Uh, he has a chart, I believe, that that starts in the year one thousand, uh, and and he thinks it's it's round about four and a half percent. This kind of uh, yield. Now, I believe that that he refers among among other sources, but one of his key sources is Homer and Sulla, our fifty five year old standard classic. There, uh, I haven't been able to to really distill from that work uh, that we should expect uh, a stable return on on these financial assets over time. As you mentioned in the beginning, I'm focusing on dis- different asset classes, not just government bonds. Yep. I also have a series uh, on private debt uh, over time. Uh, and so you can, you can. Um, it's interesting, you can go to wills, uh, you know, when, when elite investors died. Uh, in many cases, there was a legal battle over their financial assets and it's documented in courts. You can go to these archives and in... Uh, in an ideal case, you can actually get wealth breakdowns from a number of prominent sources. You can you can get a rough estimate, of course, not by by no means a a continuous series or something, but we have ideas what the approximate wealth breakdown uh, should have been over time without radical breaks or something. So when you put together public and private debt, uh, my estimate is is uh, is a figure around forty percent. Uh, of the wealth portfolio for uh, elite uh, municipal investors between the 14th and and 17th century, at least when Raymond Goldsmith's uh, book starts on on a more uh, high frequency wealth breakdown. So a significant share of wealth is showing uh, a downward trending real yield, and that means that to get to to stable returns, you have to have a full compensation on the capital appreciation part right and that i think is is not really shown in the uh, in the piketty uh, okay. work in my view so are measured by public and private and and wealth weighted yields is showing a clear downward trend over time uh, and it's by no means stable uh, and i don't think homer and Silla imply that it should be stable so i don't know where this assumption comes from that that capital returns uh, should have been expected to stay stable because people like Gregory Clark have have shown the same for land uh, yields in in England over the very long term. So land is obviously a big chunk of of your 14th, 15th century wealth yep. uh, portfolio. You have all these great feudal landlords with uh, with 60, 70 castles in in some cases, uh, and there's a big chunk of of total wealth, of course. The evidence that we have, it's it's not as comprehensive as, as we might like, but it points into the same direction, uh, that it's downward trending over time. Okay. So no matter how you slice your interest rate, your return, whether it's return on capital or wealth or it's safe asset yield, yield yeah. you got this downward trend. All right. So those are were two kind of current policy debates. We've touched on secular stagnation, Toma Piketty's worries about endless wealth spirals. <laughs> A third one I alluded to earlier was the implications for monetary policy. I don't want to get into them, but, but but clearly the way monetary policy is done is through interest rates, and that's not the only way you could do it. But the way it currently works is through adjusting either short-term rates, now more and more also in the long term, and this clearly has implications for it. So this paper of yours has gotten a lot of publicity. You're at the Bank of England as well. Have central bankers come up to you and said, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? You, you're freaking me out, Paul. I mean, if you, if you had the, the central bankers of the world come to you and say, this is not good news for us. I, uh, <clears throat> not not yet. But <laughs> not that level, okay. Maybe they are uh, still contemplating. Over, I, I have no idea. No, but but in all seriousness, I, I think I'm not focusing on, on short term, uh, of course, but, but you would expect – of course, this to have implications for for the short term as well, uh, unless the 
Well, expectation theory, right, would tell you exactly. for sure. Exactly, unless the yeah. maturity structure behaves in, in very weird ways here. So what I did get, though, is is a lot of angry responses from uh, particularly German savers who, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and in some other countries, there's this widespread belief that it was all the central banks uh, who are responsible uh, for the low interest rate environment. Uh it it stirs up a lot of emotions in some places where they say this was all the ECB's fault uh, to that we our savings don't yield anything. Uh, it was actually so in that sense it was actually in the from the other camp I see. that interesting. That, uh, are still, so you're, are you're still intent of blaming central banks for all you're this. Ma- you're giving an easy out for the central bankers. You're giving them N- not necessarily, I would say, because because you have to think about what have we to show for for all these trillions that we uh, invested in in increasing balance sheets and in that we're now investing in potentially doubling inflation targets, all these kind of things. What have we to show for it? I mean, inflation is still not a target in many places. Uh, growth uh, in the long-term context is still below trend uh, in most places. And yet we have made these gigantic efforts uh, in on the monetary policy side. You have to wonder if if that was really uh, all in vain or if it was really worth it or when the results will really show if if the theories underpinning this uh, are really correct no i'm i think um if if we accept this kind of long run trend then it suggests that uh, as i mentioned maybe in the short term we can get with a really determined effort we can get some sort of trend break uh, but this thing will come Back haunting us well, th- th- in, the, this in the longer term because um, the trend is pretty unidirectional. Okay. So this leads to the obvious question of the paper presents. Why? Why is there this persistent 500-year trend? And, and interestingly enough, I mean, you have data that goes 700 years, so it hasn't been going on the whole time, right? So something's changed within the past 500 years. It's still persisting, and we're just – now becoming aware of these savers in Europe are just now becoming cognizant of the fact that they aren't guaranteed a positive return on, on their savings. Um, but it's almost like a force of nature. But again, because it's, it starts you know only 500 years ago, what can you rule out? Maybe that's the easier way to start. What could you rule out as, as causing this? We may not know what is causing it, but what isn't causing it? I have to disappoint the people who, who waited 45 minutes for the <laughs> ultimate answer here. But uh, – I have stronger convictions on what doesn't really cut it uh, at this point. So I've looked at the usual suspects, growth, demographic factors, and uh, we have data on on both sides for for a similar period over time. So we can, as I mentioned, we can reconstruct real GDP uh, and we can reconstruct uh, population growth of the same Horizon. We also have a rough idea about life expectancy over time, so we can, at least in a uh, in a broader sense, we can look into those arguments uh, about uh, aging, about Japanification because of the the aging of etc. I don't really find that either of these two drivers is is truly convincing. Of the long run, advanced economy growth shows a sort of hockey stick development, right? Right. Uh, there are pockets of growth in advanced economies prior to 1800, say in Italy in the 15th century, we have, we have clear growth. We have growth spurt in, uh, in the Netherlands in the uh, 17th and 18th century prior to the Industrial Revolution. But really, it starts kicking off with the Industrial Revolution in the uh, late 18th and, and, and 19th centuries. At that point, real interest rates have already declined for 500 years, right? Uh, and it goes into the wrong direction, obviously, right? Uh, growth starts accelerating while real interest rates keep falling. So I have some sympathy for the literature that has questioned that kind of growth link. I mean, uh, I believe uh, Hamilton, for instance, and, and also uh, I believe Larry Summers and, and Lucas Rachel have also questioned the direct growth link in, uh, more recently. So I have su- some sympathy for these arguments. On the demographic front, a similar picture. I mean, in the short run, there's a clear correlation between demographic factors. I mean, look at the Black Death, for instance, one of the biggest demographic shocks over these 700 years. Uh, we have a massive, uh, I mean... Maybe it's timely to to remind people of this with the whole coronavirus discussion. <laughs> right. But sixty percent of European population was wiped out. 
real long-term interest rates fall by up to 6% within wow. a very short time frame. Uh, so there's a very clear reaction from the from the capital market side. But over the long term, uh, between the 16th and mid-18th century, for instance, life expectancy in England declines from something like 38 years to 33, 34 years. Huh. Um, at the same time, real interest rates decline. So it's not it's not this... Uh, my sense is it's not this uh, over over the super secular term, if you want, if you will. Uh, it doesn't really cut it. Um, so you can you can make it a m- bit more nuanced and, and do stuff like multiplying life expectancy with population change. You would end up with the same sort of dissonance here, I think. And the third is, uh, and a lot of. People in the 17th and 18th century, uh, British thinkers uh, have have made these uh, these arguments linking interest rates to geopolitical factors, war war frequency. William Paltenay, who, who was a famous uh, thinker in the 18th century, and and others have you find this in these old tracts, have always said, well, he is the most enlightened democracy of the world. Uh, we are not quarrelling on the continent like. Uh, the emperor or the the French kings, we should have the the lowest interest rates and we should have the most inflows. It turns out that that war frequency between, say, the early 16th century uh, and the Napoleonic Wars is on the rise, not not falling down for advanced economies as a whole, and yet real interest rates um, decline over the long term, even though. You know, you have these short-term shocks when Napoleon goes on on his campaigns, when the Thirty Years' War Interesting. hits, these kind of things. They're visible in the short term, but not in the long run. Not in the long run. So the, the usual suspects don't make the cut. So, I mean, you, th- you think of a typical uh, growth model in economics and what falls out of it is the real interest rate in equilibrium is equal to, like, expected productivity growth or would be the growth trend you mentioned – it's related to population or labor growth. You have more labor workers. The return to capital goes up. Also, if you have faster productivity growth, not just the level of productivity, but the growth of productivity, that should also re- increase the return to capital. And then the third thing they usually throw in there is like a discount. Right? How do people value the future versus the present it can influence? But you're saying like the, the two big ones we often think about, expected growth and population, they don't pass the test. And, you know, Joe Weisenthal, he's a, journalist for Bloomberg News. He had an interesting piece recently back in probably September. Because back in August, um, long-term yields got their lowest. Like the, I think the 10-year Swiss yield got down to minus 1%. The, the German yield was a half a percent. And then the U.S. maybe one and a half. And I think as of today, they're coming back down again. But August was kind of like the low point. It came back up for a bit. In any event, so there's a lot of talk about negative yields at that point. And he wrote this piece for the magazine, Bloomberg Magazine, where he goes, what's the big deal about negative interest rates? He goes, that's kind of a normal state of nature. And he, he made this argument that, look, you know, if you're a squirrel and you're storing nuts, you're used to negative <laughs> real interest rates. And you know, he starts with something simple like that, farming, farming faces, you know. And then he kind of generalizes that up to like, well, the entire universe is dying a slow death. Eventually, <laughs> we're going, you know, we're going to find out that the the stars will run out of energy, you know, entropy. Entropy itself should have some bearing on interest rates. Now, I, that's a very interesting argument. And, you know, the, the thing is— He is someone who is more bearish than I am. <laughs> well, the thing the thing about it is is that your trend is a 500-year trend. You'd think you'd see this story maybe over— I mean, this has been the, this has been true for a long time. I think two two things. One, the scale is much longer than probably most humans think about. Number one. So I don't know if that's really a a part of the story. And, and two, it's just difficult to maybe weave that into the standard equation. Maybe you can. Maybe you know entropy affects expected productivity growth or your discount of the future. So I go back to the standard culprits, and what you say is you don't find that they have a bearing. So. Has anyone else suggested an answer to this trend? Any other possible takes, like journalists, people who've looked at your paper, trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together and come up with a solution? No, look, what what um, what I've tried to do is look at a few of the inflection points, at least, where we had significant movements, where we have clear 
you know, breaks in a sense and see what what this is associated with on a, on a on a broader level. So I talk a bit in the paper about uh, the period in the late 15th, uh, early 16th century where we have a, a quite a significant uh, decline in in global yields from from double digit levels down to s around 6 5 and 5.5 6% within 2 3 decades. A far bigger decline than the post 1980 uh, context. These kind of people could really talk about <laughs> yeah. know, secular stagnation and thing, but there are. My hunch right now is that there are different factors at play at different points over time. The unifying theme is is might be related to capital accumulation per se, okay. but with different um, factors pulling at it at different points in time. Demographics can lead to capital accumulation in a bigger sense, as can growth, as can you know uh, imbalances between savings and investments. Obviously, now uh, there's an interesting story in the late 15th century, which which illustrates to me the kind of different factors we're talking about. So, what happens? We have the context. We have the big Black Death catastrophe in the mid 14th century. So half of the European population is wiped out. Now, what happens? Capital per worker, per surviving uh, citizen, rises exponentially suddenly. Uh, capital costs come down. But the bigger impact on, on capital markets is actually sort of psychological. Uh, all of the historical sources speak about a big shift in the mentality in, in Europe suddenly. Why? Because people realize how quickly everything can end suddenly, how how mortal their own so souls So people's are discount rates change? On earth are. The effect is that you see a massive increase in consumption, uh, yeah, especially so. luxury goods. Uh, you see in these historical sources that people go something like, and I'm simplifying, well, if it can be all over tomorrow, let's enjoy life on earth rather than up Being there. Being frugal and saving. Exactly. And so- that is consistent with with the high rates actually rising between the the 14th and and late 15th century, right? Uh, consumption capital demand is is actually growing uh, in in these kind of, for these surviving people. Gradually, the church pushes back. It is very unhappy about this kind of uh, luxurious, uh, immoral display everywhere. Uh, you remember the bonfire of the vanities. Uh, this is the kind of apex of the. Uh, religious pushback against luxury consumption. We can thank the church for the higher yields. Huh? <laughs> exactly. And what happens is in a legal sense, all over Europe, sumptuary laws come into existence. You're no longer allowed to wear fancy clothes in public. You're no longer allowed to play board games uh, in uh, in public. Uh, you're no longer allowed to throw uh, expensive uh, feasts when you marry, etc. So in a very short period of time, uh, savings rise massively. You can you can look at uh, Italian wealth data where it's nicely documented. Your European savings rates uh, go up massively in a very short time, and at the same time we see long term real interest rates decline. Um, but it's a very, I guess this is completely outside of the scope of most macro models. These kind of drivers, you know, uh, these kind of social dynamics and debates that have often pulled and influenced uh, real interest rates over time. The the origins are, you know, very varied. Uh, and I guess stuff like Sumtory Laws or Savonarola is not really incorporated in, in most macro models. So I think capital accumulation per se, as a big term, uh, is a promising, promising explanatory variable. But I wouldn't pin uh, the explanation on any of these these drivers that we have discussed, like demographics, like growth per se. Well, Paul, you have created a great research agenda for some budding young economists to look in and, and to find out what is driving this. So your your work will spawn future work trying to answer this puzzle. And uh, it's great that you have started it, kicked it off. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Paul Schmelzing. Paul's paper is... Eight centuries of global real interest rates, R minus G, and the super secular decline, 1311 to 2018. Check it out. Paul, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much, David, for, for having me. Uh, and any pushback or comments from your listeners are always most welcome. Mm -hmm.
Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.